you know, there's a, there's a level of awareness that, um, uh, that they have about uh, how others feel. Um, and look, they've also done the hard work on themselves so that they can feel secure with themselves enough to think about somebody other than themselves. I mean, look, our culture is so obsessed with self-centeredness. Now that, now that we have these cameras that we can take pictures and how do I look? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really detrimental to people's mental health, yeah. honestly. And the further we can get away from that and the more we can, can, uh, feel secure in ourselves so that we don't have to be constantly self-obsessed, uh, you're going to do better in life and you're going to be a better product designer. I'm so delighted to welcome our special guest today, who is James Courier. Now, most of you probably know James as the general partner at NFX Ventures. He's also an angel investor who invested in companies like DoorDash, Lyft, and Patreon, and is a serial founder, including way back in the dot-com boom, a company called Tickle.com that was the fastest growing website in the world. And of course, as the head of NFX, he is one of the smartest people in Silicon Valley, one of the world's experts on network effects. But even more important from my perspective, he was one of the first people who showed that you could be a Harvard Business School graduate and still be a successful entrepreneur. So James, thank you for joining and being my role model. Thank you, Chris. We, we don't talk, we don't speak of these things. We, we, just, <laughs> we just build. Yes, exactly. There's a famous saying, you know, add a million dollars of valuation for every engineer, subtract a million and a half dollars for every Harvard MBA. At least. So one of the things that before we really launch in and, and get into some of the lessons we want to cover, uh, I know that you recently launched a new masterclass on network effects. And clearly, if someone wanted to understand network effects, there's no better place than going to NFX. So can you tell us more about it and where can our listeners go if they want to enroll? Sure. So uh, we've got a website called nfx.com and you can go there and that's where they can see nfx.com slash masterclass. And it's uh, 11 episodes, three hours of video explaining all these nuances of, of network effects. And it's essentially like a book, but you don't have to read it for 16 hours. You just get to watch for, for three and that'll give you most of the main ideas around it. There's also probably 15 different articles or essays on the website that you can look into for network effects and growth and that sort of stuff. We we do our best to educate people about this topic we're obsessed with. And we've been obsessed with it for about 20 years. And that's why we called our firm NFX, which stands for network effects. And by the way, James, I can tell you, and this is completely true because as everyone knows, I'm incapable of lying anyways, but we, when we're working with entrepreneurs, we'll direct them to the NFX website. It is the Bible for learning about network effects. So this network effects masterclass is probably amazing. Uh, I have not taken it yet, uh, full disclosure, but I will strongly recommend that if someone is interested in network effects, which are a key component, often the key component in blitz scalability, you should take this class. Well, thanks very much. And and in case you're wondering if it's worth going, we're, we're now the fourth largest VC website in the world after Sequoia and Andreessen. And uh, and we've got 200,000 people on our email mailing list. So there's a lot of people who are engaged with the content. So that's that makes us happy because we can only invest in 0.4% of the companies we see, right? So. Well, it's always good to have a broad reach. And that sort of ties in with what brought up today's podcast. So I happened to watch along with Julian this awesome YouTube video that you made in conjunction with our friends at Greylock, where you were talking about a very important topic, which is that entrepreneurs and everyone else for that matter, they talk about themselves too much. They focus on their own point of view. What does this mean for them? What do they need as opposed to the people that they are selling to or trying to work with, right? Putting themselves, having that empathy to walk in someone else's shoes. So I thought this was so important. I'm always reminding people, guess what? Nobody cares what you what you want. They care what they want. Tell us more about this. When did you first observe this and why is it so important? Yeah, this is fundamental. And I first observed it when I was building websites back in 1999 and 2000s. And I would be working with people on my team and they would put up marketing copy. They would put up you know, email uh, headers or what would stay in the email, what the landing pages would be would be talking about their enthusiasm for the product we were building as a team at this company, Tickle, that I had started. And I realized that the people who are landing on these pages or opening these emails, they don't care. And I had a struggle with the people I was working with to get them to not talk about us. 
not talk about how great our product has now had all these different people in the community. You know, we have 200,000 people in the community. I'm like, dude, you're still talking about your product. You need to talk to the users about themselves because that's fundamentally everybody's favorite topic. In fact, our first company, Tickle, was built around that idea. The tagline was all about you. And it was literally just a whole series of self-assessment tests so that people could uh, answer questions about themselves and get this website to tell them about them. And everyone was interested, which is why, we, as you said, we were the fastest growing website in the world. And based on this principle of telling people about themselves, and they would send it around to their friends because they were saying, I want to hear about you. But really, they wanted their friends to hear about them because they're really interested in themselves. They want their friends to be interested in themselves. And so this was incredibly viral. I think we registered 150 million people out of the 600 million people who were on the internet at that time. And so that about 25% of the whole internet was using our website. And so uh, this principle is is fundamental to how uh, people operate. And and it's been a conundrum forever. I mean, think about Buddha. I mean, Buddha is trying to explain to you, it's you aren't who you think you are. You have to disassociate yourself from yourself and then you reach enlightenment. And it's the same thing with product designers. You have to disassociate yourself with what you're doing and how great you are and say, oh, please come to our website. I've built this stuff for you. You should get all this benefit. You got to go beyond that and say, here's here's just all about you. You just start with them and you talk with them. And so that's, that's where I first encountered it. And I encountered it again. If you want to keep talking about this, you know, Please. you would go, to, you would go to uh, clients like Ford Motor Company, and they would say, "Oh, could, we'll pay you two hundred thousand dollars to build us a quiz on your website of Tickle to talk about Ford Company and uh, Ford cars that, you know, about this Ford car, that Ford car, that Ford car." And I had to explain to them while I'm sitting there in the office. I'm like, "Guys, there's a hundred thousand people who care about Ford, and there's another hundred million American consumers who could buy a Ford." Don't just make it for the 100,000. Make it for the people who don't think about Ford every day. I know you guys think about Ford every day because you work here. You walk into the building that says Ford. You wear the Ford clothing. You think about Ford. Nobody thinks about Ford. They think about themselves. And maybe once a month, they think about their car. And they're not even aware that it's a Ford, most of them. So... And and they just couldn't they couldn't understand and they just wanted a, a a quiz that was about Ford cars and all this so we did it for them they paid us and they never did another one because it never got big and I think and so then what we did was we just made a car test and that had 14 million people take it in four weeks and you know we could have at one point put in two or three Fords and emphasize them to give them a really good advertising lift but they couldn't see it and so we lost out they lost out because they couldn't get past thinking about their product rather than thinking about the potential buyer. Yeah. And it is a basic reflection of human nature. Now in that YouTube video that you did for Greylock, you tell this great story about a couple who owned a building. Hmm. And I don't yeah. know if you can tell a quick version of that story because sure. I think it, it so perfectly encapsulates this principle. Right. So imagine an eight story building in New York. It's got all these apartments in it and people walk into the lobby. They press the button to go up in the elevator and they have to wait there. The elevator is really slow. And every day they come to the landlords and they complain that the elevator is slow. So the husband puts up a, a painting, beautiful painting on the wall. And for three weeks, no one complains. But after three weeks, the complaints about the slow elevator continue because people have become bored of looking at the same painting. And so the wife puts up a mirror instead of the painting. And they never had another complaint because people could stand there for three, four, eight minutes and just look at themselves. They never complained about the slow elevator again. And just imagine it would be even more effective today because they'd be staring at themselves and then shooting TikToks. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, what you've described are the fact that you know you need to be self-less uh, as opposed to being self-centered when you are considering how you communicate with others. Who are the, some of the people that you know who are really exemplars of this, who have become so unself-centered, so selfless that they've been able to use this principle effectively? What are the things they have in common? Uh, well, I think the people that that you know most, uh, most like Oprah, you know, she is so empathetic and she is so in the shoes of her listeners at all times that every word that comes out of her mouth relates to them and how they must feel. And as a result, she's become whatever the greatest broadcaster of, of her generation. Um, and you know, there's a there's a level of awareness that um, 
uh, that they have about uh, how others feel. Um, and look, they've also done the hard work on themselves so that they can feel secure with themselves enough to think about somebody other than themselves. I mean, look, our culture is so obsessed with self-centeredness. Now that now that we have these cameras that we can take pictures and how do I look? Uh, it's uh, it's it's really detrimental to people's mental health, yeah. honestly. And the further we can get away from that, and the more we can can uh, feel secure in ourselves, so that we don't have to be constantly self obsessed. Uh, you're going to do better in life, and you're going to be a better product designer, and you're going to scale your business faster. So it's 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 that hard work, and and it could be that you need to read books or get therapy or go to the Landmark Forum or go to Hoffman Institute and do the hard work on yourself so that there's space in you for everyone else rather than this constant self-questioning and self-doubt and self-analysis. And it's just, at some point it gets boring uh, and, uh, and it's not healthy for you. You don't enjoy your life that way. Now, anybody who was able to watch our video would tell that we're not the kind of guys who dress up in a way that indicates that we're really focused on our appearance. But I'm very curious. You mentioned a whole bunch of things like which of those things did you do? How did you develop this kind of insight and wisdom and ability to, to take yourself out of the equation? I think it was two things. I did do the work. I mean, I have read all the self-help books. I have taken the Hoffman. I have taken the Landmark Forum. I have you know, had long conversations with my wife and other people close to me about personal development. Uh, I do try to learn how to have hard conversations with people uh, so that we have some authenticity, you know, that sort of candor that, that we talk about. Um, and, and I find myself um, disappointed and sort of annoyed with those who don't. And from that disappointment and annoyance, uh, I then have forced myself to be the person I want to be with relation to product design and development. And, uh, and, and so if you can, if you can really see how annoying it is when someone talks about themselves all day or at, at dinner or, um, or, or you see the lower click through rate on the things you build to talk about yourself, you, you'll start to get a sense of, of what I'm talking about and release yourself. And I think, uh, maybe it's even the first part of the process of, of enlightenment and, uh, Buddhahood, but I'll, I'll figure that out over the next 40 years as I progress in that, in that way too. Now, one of the other things we have in common besides that Harvard MBA that we must not speak of, although I will mention, as I'm moving houses, I was actually looking through all my old notebooks. I'd kept everything and I was, my wife forced me to discard some of them. So she said, you can keep some of the materials. You can't keep all of them. You got to go through. So I was looking through my lead, my marketing, my FRC and all foundations. I had all this stuff and I was keeping like the really fancy uh, famous cases like a uh, Butler lumber or something like that, optical distortion, etc. cetera. Uh, but the other thing that we have in common is that we have made the turn to the dark side and are now investors, educators and thinkers, but investors. And with investors, one of the things I find is that you're supposed to, it feels like, beat your chest talk when you're talking to LPs. You're like, oh, let me tell you about my incredible record and my DPI and TBPI and MOIC and here's the track record and blah, blah, blah. It seems to go against what you've been talking about. I mean, how do you apply these principles in, in communications with potential LPs? Yeah. So two things. One, you have to spend time talking to the first six or eight LPs to find out from them what language means to them, what different words mean to them. What is every other venture firm pitching to the LPs? Just like you would if you're a founder pitching to a, a, a VC, you have to find out what the latest language evolution is because language is always evolving. And you know it might be that 20 years ago that everyone was into IRRs and now they're into MOICs and MOICs, right? And, and you have to find that out. You can't pitch today that you're the uh, Uber of blank. But you could have in 2013 to 15, but by 2016, it was kind of over. And you need to be sensitive to the language evolutions of the people that you're pitching to. Uh, the second thing is that you need to spend time asking them lots of questions and actually engaging them. Okay. And actually, I've got an article uh, called The Winning Psychology of Founders Raising Venture Capital. And in it, it lists 40 questions that you should be asking GPs, you know, guys like you and me. And we should be asking LPs similar types of questions to open them up to hear what they really think. Uh, for instance, one I like to ask LPs at the end is when you go back to your investment committee, what, what concerns are they going to have? Right. Because 
that allows them to express all of their own concerns without saying, I'm confronting you face to face in what would might be an awkward way. Um, particularly because the LPs are typically, you know, more introverted personalities. And so they have a tough time, you know, being confrontational or having any sort of friction uh, between people. And so you have to create a safe space and a safe context for them to give you the information that's going to be helpful to you. And, and again, you have to think through what their needs are. Uh, they do want to tell you what they're really seeing when they hear your pitch and how it's not so similar to other ones and they can't tell the difference between you and somebody else. Uh, but they can't tell you that unless you create a safe space for them. So those are the two things that that we certainly try to do. Um, and then the other thing you do is just give superior returns and then it doesn't really matter. They just send you the check. So that's the other thing we do. That's the thing. The first fund, it's all about how can you tell the story? How can you stand out? By fund two or fund three, they know whether or not it works. And yeah. that's basically what happens. Yeah. Well, uh, I can tell you, and I don't know how many people on this call right now who are listening in or thinking to themselves, you know, I'd like to invest in venture capital, but if there's a good bet in venture capital, it's NFX. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Chris. Now, some of the folks that we have listening in are also young people who are early on in their careers. And it feels like, like you said, you have to do the work, you have to learn about yourself, you have to learn how to develop the emotional maturity, and some of that comes with age. But what do you think young people can do to fast track that process, to learn how to develop this sort of selflessness and to be able to put the self aside? I think you have to practice authenticity with people and you have to prove to yourself that if you can figure out who's got good character and who is mature enough to handle it, your authenticity with them is going to pay off 10x because it's so rare that people are authentic with each other uh, in most environments. Um, you know, when I moved to Silicon Valley and met guys like David Hornick and Stan Chudnovsky, who were so incredibly authentic, uh, Rick Marini, the these were my near, you know, Chris Michael, these were my near circle people when I first moved here 22 years ago. And they and I helped create a context for hundreds of people to be more and more authentic. And that is the Silicon Valley I know. And all these reports about, you know, all the bro culture and all the toxicness, I hardly ever see that in my world because I don't surround myself with those people. I don't attract those people. I attract the authentic people who are really trying to do the work, who are product obsessionals, who are hobbyists. They're not here for the money. They're not here for the power. They're here because they like building stuff. And when you're in those types of communities, when you're you're tracking with people with that character and with that sort of self-knowledge to be authentic and vulnerable in a way, you get to the real answers much faster and as a result, like I've never taken money and lost any person a dime with my four or five companies now that I've started, because you always find a way to win. You always are honest with yourself so that you never get to the point of going out of business. You always find a way to win um, in that in that situation. And you know, I've seen that pattern repeat in many many of the big billion dollar companies that I've been involved with. And I think you made a point there that is so important that I want to underscore, which is that entrepreneurship, venture capital, all the things like every element of life is a team sport. And it's about surrounding yourself with people who share the same kind of values, that devotion to authenticity, that ability to put the self aside and really focus on others and focus on what's actually happening there. And it doesn't have to be a lonely pursuit. I mean, most people say being a CEO is a lonely thing. It absolutely is true if you only know people in your own company. But if you know other CEOs, it doesn't have to be lonely. It can be a whole community of people rooting for each other, helping each other, and supporting each other through all these difficult times we face. Couldn't agree more. In fact, we don't call our investments uh, a portfolio. We call it the guild because it's the NFX guild is a community of CEOs and, and founders who are helping each other. And, and that's part of the idea from the beginning. I also love the fact that you referred to a couple of folks like David Hornick and Stan and uh, Rick. And I think we saw all of them at the Master of Scale Summit. Was Chris there? I might have missed him. I think Chris was traveling. Damn it. Well, next time. Because if he had been there, we might have had a chance to be in one of his famous photographs. That's right. He's an amazing photographer now. This is the guy, this is a guy named Chris Michael, who, if you haven't met him, uh, if you're listening, you should track him down. He's the only guy I know who has been the best at three different careers. So he, in the Navy, ended up being right at the top and working with the Admiral by age 27, went straight to the top of the Navy. And, and then he came out and started two 
tech companies, both of which were successful, both of which he sold for tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. And then he kind of stopped and now he's become a photographer and he is the uh, a photographer in residence of the uh, Academies of Sciences. He, when the Dalai Lama comes to the United States, he's the official photographer. He, the guy, the guy is one of the best photographers in the country. It's he's a remarkable person. Yeah, and I think that it just reflects the fact that you have decided in life how do I surround myself with remarkable people. And we talked a little bit earlier about how there are folks in Silicon Valley who are like, oh, these high taxes. Let me go move to some place in the middle of Nevada where I don't have to pay taxes. And I'm like, my God, that is the last thing in the world you should be worried about. You should be worried about surrounding yourself with the most amazing people so that your life can be amazing. That's right. It's not about saving or preserving. It's about creating and making. Well, I cannot think of a better note to end on. James, thank you so much for your insights, your wisdoms. It's been a pleasure to be talking about these subjects with you. If you have any final words that you would like to leave our audience with, I'll turn it over to you. No, just thanks for doing this, Chris. I think this is going to accelerate a lot of people's development. It's important. 